Hi, Tomodachi. Welcome back to the Tokyo Show with your host, Nicholas Pettis. Today, we are starting uh, to read the audiobook of The Blue Eyed Samurai. Uh, it's a book about my first three years in Japan, how I got to Japan, and kind of like how the whole starting process for finishing as、uh, one of the two、uh, foreign Uchideshis ever to finish under Soul Sai Oyama Statsu's program for the Uchideshi, A Thousand Years of Living in a Dormitory. So, Um, without any further ado, if you're watching this, then you probably already know、uh, most of the story. But、um, why don't you go on a trip with me and、uh, just check it out, right? It's a pretty good, cool story. I'm going to be doing some uh, extra uh, curricular stuff or whatever you call it、uh, once in a while. So I'm going to go off script a little bit here and there when I feel like I can do that. And、um, basically, I'm just going to follow the book. So why don't you、uh, sit back down and make yourself comfortable,、uh, get a cup of coffee? And、um, this is chapter one. Uh, the preface is,、um, I'm going to go over that like, a little bit off script because I just want to tell you guys that、uh, it says it's a true story. Everything I've written in this book is as it was, and、uh, it is as was for how I remember everything. Remember, it's my story and it's about my feelings.、Um, And it's about me、uh, really, really digging deep.、Um, it took me 10 years to write the book、uh, because. Uh, yeah, I was always training <laughs> and I never really had time to sit down and do it. But、uh, when I broke my leg in a fight, I、uh, decided to buy a computer、uh, that I could、um, you know, carry around with me. So I bought one of those little、um, laptops or whatever you call them. And、uh, I just started writing every time I was on a Shinkansen or sitting on a set for a movie or a, a TV drama or something like that. When I was waiting around, I just started typing out and typing out and typing out. And then once I started moving around and training again, the book was put on hold.、Um, anyway, long story、uh, short is that it took me 10 years to finish the book. And then I started selling it after it got edited a little bit.、Um, there's still a lot of editing to be done in the book, actually,、uh, but it is what it is right now. And I think that、um, I feel that it's a very, very personal story. I really dig deep into this book. And.、Um, I stopped selling it on,、uh, on you know, international platforms and I stopped selling it in Japan. I literally just stopped selling the book.、Um, so、uh, I think that I think it's a chance for a lot of young guys、uh, who are starting in karate or for those of you who have done it for a while that you could get、um, uh, learn a lot from this story, maybe about how I、uh, thought and processed、uh, as to become、uh, the last、uh, Uchideshi of、uh, Oyama Statsu. All right,、um, let's get into it. So, the beginning.、Uh, before I started karate, I had tried a lot of different things. I'd played handball,、uh, was picked to be the goalkeeper there.、Uh, I'd played cricket, and again, I was picked to be the keeper there.、Um, even when we tried soccer, I was also just put in the corner and said, go just you know, stand there in, in the goal.、Um, so, I never really felt comfortable doing、um, ball sports as per se.、Um, I got pretty much into cricket for a while there. We were really like, had a little team from the classmates that were really getting into it.、Um, but it wasn't really.、Um, Something that I, I stuck with. What I really stuck with was、um, the influence from、uh, the movie ET, where they had these BMX bicycles, they were like, you know, going up and down hills and stuff like that. And I happened to live just across the street from where.、Um, Uh, the two biggest parks in, in Copenhagen are located. And so those parks are really cool,、um, like lots of hills and stuff like that.、Uh, Flaxbergheu on Sönemagen. Now, Flaxbergheu is like the Royal Queen's Garden.、Um, it's like for her summer vacation house kind of thing there. So it is really well kept, and there are like guard、uh, patrols and stuff in there that、uh, you really don't want to get caught by because、uh, they get really angry for seeing kids、uh, trashing up on their bicycles in there. But Sönemagen was another story. There was a, a whole bunch of areas where we had these、uh, big jumps. And stuff like that, and、uh, we got pretty、um, pretty intense on those bicycles back then. Yeah, it was really fun. So, I used to be、uh, pretty good at riding the BMX, and I was happy to,、um, to learn how to fix bicycles with my brother.、Um, So, we didn't have a lot of money. <clears throat> What we did was we,、uh, we would、uh, pass newspapers around the neighborhood and save up money and buy parts like, like cool looking tires or like a, a handlebar and stuff like that. So, they slowly over time evolved,、um, and it was just like a hobby that we were really happy to do. Uh, my brother Tony uh, ended up、uh, running a bicycle shop for more than 10 years, actually. So that's how good he got at building and, and, and taking bicycles apart.、Um, by that time, though, I was already in Japan、um, training for fighting. Yeah. So let's see. Okay, here we go. 
Uh, in Denmark, uh, when I was about 14, I started going to these youth clubs, which are really popular in Denmark. The youth clubs are full of young people ranging from 14 to 18 years old. And every third Friday on each of the month, we would uh, get together for a party at this youth club. So it was like open until like 10 o'clock at night or whatever. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off script here again because it's like I feel like I have to be completely honest here. So I met a friend called Jesper. Um, and his parents used to have a summer vacation house. So on the weekends, they generally were not in, in Copenhagen. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we would just be hanging out. I'd be staying over at his place the whole time or he'd come over and stay over at my place. We were like really, really best friends. Um, we only had one problem. <laughs> we, uh, we figured out that if we could go down to Eldi, which is like a supermarket in Denmark, uh, super cheap stuff, like uh, yeah, super, really super cheap stuff, uh, we could get a bottle of gin and two, uh, uh, four bottles of Surfer Coke. And then we would like split it up in equal portions. So we'd get half a bottle of gin each and split that into the bottles of Coke. And then we would uh, pre-drink to get ready for the party time, right? So we'd be completely wasted by the time we got to the party. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is probably not the best uh, um, thing to do when you're a 14 year old kid, but it's the truth. It's what we did. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we got to the drink, uh, to, to the party and we were pretty drunk. Now, uh, sometimes there were some fights going on at uh, these clubs, right? Now, let me just, uh, because I don't really get into detail about this too much in the book, but I want to get into details here on the audiobook. Um, and so um, I had to, uh, to, to DJ at one of the parties one time. I'd taken this DJ test and it's like, you, you're okay to DJ on the, on the party night. So I got my half hour slot or one hour slot or whatever it was where I was, uh, you know, doing my DJ time. Uh, this other guy comes up to me that I've never seen before and says, hey, man, I want you to play the, whatever song it is. Maybe it was Aha or something like that. Um, remember, this is back in 1988, right? Or 87 or something like that. Um, and so uh, I was like, nah, nah, man, piss off. You know, I don't really, I don't really care about that song. You know, it's like I'm doing my thing, you know. And that guy was a street fighter. And I didn't know. I was not a street fighter. I was a short, little, chubby kid that really wasn't very good at sports, but just liked to ride around on my BMX. Uh, and that's about it. I had a very, um, <laughs> yeah, cheeky uh, uh, mouth on me. And so uh, I must have really like pissed him off. Anyway, uh, go outside. I'm about to uh, unlock my bicycle to go home uh, with my friend. And um, this is all I remember. I see in this uh, soccer ball kick coming up into my face. Boof! He kicked me right in the face, I swear. And then I remember him trying to beat the crap out of me. And um, like he was trying to pull me down. And I just remember seeing this knee coming right into my eye. So I got this knee kick in the face. And then um, I figured out that when people get super scared or something, that the first thing that happens is you either fight or you flight. And I flight, flighted or whatever. So I just literally ran away as fast as I could. Um, and so I sprinted across this massive street uh, and uh, jumped into someone's garden and I was lying there um, uh, hiding behind a big snow cone. It was like in the, in the middle of winter. So there was snow on the ground and stuff like that. And I was scared, scared. Like, you know, if you, if you, if you, I don't know how to explain it. It's just like, you may, you know, your, your heart is pounding so hard. And it's like the only thing that goes through your head is like, I just, I hope he doesn't find me. I hope he doesn't find me because I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to fight. I don't know how to protect myself. And then uh, lying there uh, trying to like <sighs> recover my breath, you know, and trying to make my breath like quiet. So maybe if he could hear me, maybe he'd come chasing me down, right? Uh, turns out that he, 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 you know, he jumped on a bus and, and got out of there pretty quickly. But uh, I didn't know that. So I was just lying there. And then so I slowly hear the friends, uh, my, my friend's voice is going, Nick, where are you? He's gone. It's okay. You know, and I was like trying to get out of this haze there. And I just did this one thing that inside my head was like, okay, I, I, I really never, ever, ever want to feel like this again. And then it popped into me. In my head, I heard this word karate. You can do karate. And that was, um, didn't know it at the time, but it was the influence from the movie, The Karate Kid. Um, I just literally saw myself as, as if, if this karate kid, Mouth Magic, could do it, then I could do it too. Um, so we're going to go back into the book, but that's basically how it felt like, um, my pride was hurt badly, but my, I got back to my friends and I had a big black eye for a while. And then, then I started to look into what karate was. Um, I'm going to go ahead here. Yeah. It took me, a. Uh, yeah, so I was all excited and could hardly wait to start training. But even then I didn't try to find a dojo. I didn't even try to read up on it. I just knew karate was for me. It just so happened that Michael, one of my brother's uh, classmates, had once done Kyokushin Karate. He had heard from Tony that I wanted to do Karate and offered to take me to his old dojo and also give, him, uh, give me his old dogi. 
I remember the day we went to the dojo. It was the first time I'd seen how karate training was actually done. I just knew that this was what I wanted. Hearing the way everybody did kiai and uh, answering the sensei with os or a big os, os, uh, depending on how you felt at the time. For me, it was like, like it sent shivers down my spine. And I, all I just wanted to do was change into the dogi and join the class right there. Uh, obviously, that's not the right thing to do. So I did the right thing. I went right out to the front desk, filled out the forms, um, and had to bring the forms back to my mom because I was under 18. I was still 14. Um, and then uh, the next day, I was enrolled. Uh, that night when we went back and uh, tried the dogi on that Michael had given me, um, I just had to sh he, had, he had to just show me how to tie the belt once, and then I knew how to do it. It was as if it had been waiting for me and calling me home after all this time. I knew that this is what I wanted to do, and I knew that my life was going to be changed forever. The next day I signed up, it was January 11th, 1988, just two weeks before my 15th birthday, that I became an official member of the Kyokushin Kaikan. I still remember the first class I had. Uh, I thought that the instructor was awesome standing there in front of us all looking like Chuck Norris. The beard and everything. He was really cool. Uh, everybody was doing ki and it didn't feel strange. It felt good to use my voice. And most of the techniques came easy to me. I picked it up really easy. Um, the sensei said, so where have you done karate before? And I was thought, I thought he was joking. I was like, I've never done karate before. Um, and that's kind of how easy it came to me. Um, of course, you know, the higher level techniques took a little bit longer, but I soon found myself with a whole arsenal of techniques I could use any way I wanted to. The fact that it came also naturally me just made me want to exploit it all further. I was 165 centimeters tall and weighed about 76 kilos when I started. And six months later, I dropped 12 kilos and gotten like really lean. Um, I got really skinny actually. Um, and I walked differently, I smiled uh, differently, you know, I just had more confidence with myself. So it was an amazing transformation to go through. At the same time, I felt like I needed that. My training was really doing everything for me. I could not like take uh, time out away from my training. I'd gotten completely in the zone. Like I stopped hanging out with my friends uh, from school that I used to. Uh, and it was just going to the dojo every day, like literally uh, knocking on the door because they open up at 4.30, I think. Uh, and I was like out there at like three o'clock or whatever. Just let me in, let me in kind of thing. Um, and that's how much uh, I love this thing. So I thought that I had found a path in life which demanded my fullest attention, but when I started to neglect my schoolwork and my grades started to fall, uh, I was in for a rude awakening. My English, uh, spoken English, uh, went from a top grade uh, to like a, a completely, uh, literally grade. Um, and that's when my mom paid attention. Uh, she said, okay, uh, if you don't take care of your grades, I'm not going to pay for your tuition to go to karate. So I think growing up with a mother of that capacity instilled a different way of looking at things because she was uh, always a school teacher and she knew how to guide us and kind of make it look like uh, the way that we came to uh, conclusions all by ourselves, just by, you know, pushing a little bit here and nudging a little bit there. So I um, came up with a plan to go straight to the library and open up my books and study and so that I could get my homework done and do my training. Bam. This was great. The results were very good and I was saved. I could continue my training and following year I graduated from junior high school with a perfect grade in spoken English, much to my relief of my father John. Uh, I think he said something like, it's about bloody time too. <laughs> yeah, it was not long after that that I started teaching kids classes in exchange for my training fees, which meant that I, it didn't mean that I neglected my schoolwork, at least not that year, but uh, I was kind of like gambling with, hey, I don't have to do this. I can uh, just highball it or, you know, because uh, I'm paying for my own training now. Anyway, uh, it was about that time when I had a conversation with one of my green belt senpais in the dojo. He goes, Nicholas, you're like those Uchideshi in Japan, always at the dojo training like a madman. Oz? And I go, what's your Uchihashi? He goes, no, 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 uh, not Uchihashi, Uchideshi. You know, the living students of Masoyama, right? Well, you seem to be at the dojo all the time, so it just made me think of one of those guys. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Now come, I'm sorry, like, Sosai, may you please rest in peace. I'm sorry for saying this. But my reaction at that time was like, wait, you're telling me that old dude on the black and white photos that are hanging over there on the wall, that he's still alive? And he's teaching karate in Tokyo? Bing! This is where it was. I saw myself as the karate kid just reliving it. I just knew I had to do it. He also knew that there had been no other foreigner ever to have graduated at that point. And I was like, I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be that guy. Uh, that night, I spoke to my mother about it, and she tried to somehow relate to my feelings, although it must have been hard having a son whose mind was set on leaving school and going off to Japan to learn karate. 
we agreed that I would school, uh, stay in school until the end of the year and work up and save money to it. So all I needed to do now was convince my teacher, Shihan Boots. I went to him and said, oh, Shihan, I want to go to Japan to come to Ushijashi. He looked at me and laughed. <laughs> no, you don't, he said. That's exactly what he said. Anyway, I really kept going back to him for like, I think every day for like a week, I was like, you know, I, I really want to do this Ushijashi. And he goes, well, what did your mother say? Um, and I explained to him that she was going to be uh, supporting it or not just financially, but also like as in, you know, this is what you got to do, Nick. Well, then this is what you got to do. Uh, which was a, a very big decision for a 17-year-old kid. We're talking flying all the way from Denmark, half across the world, into a program that I have zero knowledge of. There was no one that knew what really went on inside the dormitory. Anyway, um, after some time... Uh, yes. So here it is. Um, after some time during which I continued my training and teaching the kids class, we met again and Shien Boots said, I asked if I still wanted to do, go uh, to Japan as I'd asked him earlier in the year. And all I said was, Oh, I want to go to Japan. He then agreed to write a letter to Sosai, which was sent off to Japan during the spring of 1990. The few months of waiting for the reply felt like years. Uh, that year, we had invited British fighter Michael Thompson to our summer camp. I was already more or less at Uchideshi at the dojo in Denmark and I... Uh, me and a couple of guys were you know, preparing stuff for leaving for the camp that morning when Sosai came, uh, the letter from Sosai came. Uh, my heart leapt and the first thing I did was run back up to the dojo, go into the instructor's room. I sat down before opening the letter. I whispered a small prayer. This is really, really what I wanted to do more than anything else in life. So the outcome would change my life forever or it would send me right back to school. Um, in the book, there is a copy of what it looks like, that letter, it's super simple, and it says, Dear Nicholas, thank you for the letter on April uh, 15th, I think it is, 1990. Uh, it was a nice letter. I decided to accept you as an Uchideshi. <laughs> yes, uh, and come in next year in April or something like that. Wow, uh, that was cool. So, now I just needed to support, uh, save up money and support. I went straight back to school and quit, uh, actually, after the summer camp. And so, I never went back to high school, which means that I actually really never finished high school properly. Anyway, that summer camp was the best camp I'd ever had. I was so full of energy. And no matter what happened, I felt I could survive anything. Since then, Michael Thompson arrived the next day, and from then on, my vision on fighting has changed forever. He was so full of life and his teaching so inspiring. We all loved him from the very first day. I was able to speak English with him, and also being the highest-ranked brown belt, I had the privilege of getting extra few tips here and there. The memory stands out mostly from that camp was the night session. Yeah, we have night sessions on the Danish camps. They're pretty intense and crazy. We were woken up during the night with sounds of uh, a fire alarm. And you have three minutes to get your dojo on a symbol outside or you'll be doing a hundred push-ups. Now come on, get up, get up, get up. Everyone was screaming, all the black belts running around with the megaphones. Where everyone's freaking out, you know, it's like, whoa, my God, it's night training. It's tonight, it's right now, you know. And so you get up and you get your dogi on. So I, I think I was like one of the first pe people to get out there. I think I was already sleeping in my dogi pants because I knew something was going to happen. Um, we brought the kick mitts and then we started running. Shion Boots and Sensei Michael were hitting us with the shinai and yelling at us on the megaphones. Come on, move. Go, go, go. And then we were doing burpees and all this crazy stuff. And then uh, at one point we ran into this big field. And then like the kick mitts and punching uh, combinations and, and like, you know, stuff just started, you know. And, um, and then the sparring started. Yeah, it was in the middle of the night. You can't see anything, you know. And they got the megaphones going on. It's like we were split up in three different groups. There's one group on the left side, one group in the middle, and then one group on the light side. And then so people were going in to spar the middle group, and they were going out, and this other group were coming back in, and then they would rotate all this around. It was unreal. I felt like a like a like a beast had been uh, like uh, unleashed that night. Um, I remember dropping like several of my my senpai or several of my kohai and stuff like that, and it's like pulling them up and saying, "Come on, man, fight me back." Um, it was pretty intense. <laughs> uh, I definitely felt like uh, after that that I was ready to go to Japan. Um, on returning from the cramp, I agreed with Xi'an Boots that I would teach in the dojo and work as a uchideshi until leaving to save up money. Uh, I would be able to save up money and then still get a chance to get used to the lifestyle of a, uh, living with karate full time. I was able to go home whenever I wanted to. I didn't have to sleep there. However, I heard that the uchideshis would get up every morning and do morning training. And I also decided to get up and do my own training. Um, I made a program myself where I would run five kilometers around this big park that was close to the dojo and then do push-ups, sit-ups for about 10, 10, 20 minutes and then I'd be working on the sandbag for half an hour. And I had no idea what kind of training they did in Japan so I thought it was I was doing pretty good all by myself. 
Then I would clean the dojo, wash the shower. Sometimes I would uh, do something else like paint the, the, the doors or something like that. In the afternoon, I had the children's classes and the juniors classes to teach. And after that, depending on the day, I was either in the grown-ups uh, class uh, teaching white belts or doing uh, Xi'an's black belt and brown belt class. Uh, when I trained with everyone else. On Fridays, we had our fighting class with my senpai, Mas Fleece, uh, and he was always running a really uh, tough and tight class there. Uh, during that time, I went through a period where I refused to see any of my friends. I wanted to test myself and see if I was able to cope with the pressure of being left alone. I've always been very open with my friends, and whenever I could find time to spend with them, uh, I was always like hanging out and you know riding uh, dirt bikes and stuff like that. But I told all my closest friends not to call me until I called them. Uh, I decided not to drink any alcohol and try to live as much as possible at the dojo. I became obsessed with the idea of letting myself down. Um, I'm going to go off script here a little bit. Uh, this living at the dojo. So I could sleep inside the dojo. You know, I had brought like a blanket and stuff like that. But it's like uh, being in Denmark at the same time living as an uchideshi in a Danish dojo. Uh, like staying over at night was just insane. It was like loneliness at, at a completely different level. There was no... Uh, cell phones there was no internet there was just being in the dojo you know I don't even think I was reading books it was just like meditating and stuff like that I was at a completely different level and I was kind of going a little bit crazy to be honest uh, yeah it wasn't really uh, realistic during that period I went through a lot of emotions I stayed away from my friends I didn't talk to anybody uh, of course I had all the teaching and training to do but I trained I was always very serious it wasn't very social not for me anyway um, I was very like it had to be done right. It had to be hard core. Um, and all the thoughts that go through your head uh, during that time, uh, you had so much time to just analyze everything. So you start thinking about something. And before you know it, you've spent the last two or three days thinking about it. You either look forward to the next training session or you worry about it. Loneliness hits you worse when it's early in the morning and you have to wake up and do your own training. Um, you're, si you're tired and sore from last night. but um, And all those like weaknesses, all those excuses that aren't coming into you, um, they're just like plain mind tricks you know all you got to do is uh start stretching and get on with it and then you know you get the job done and then you can feel proud yeah it was uh it was after time being alone i didn't know if i was doing well or was stuck in the same spot because it was just all doing it for myself so i think it was about two months into the solitude period and i called up one of my friends and said hey man let's get drunk and uh we did i just remember that i felt guilty the whole time and something really awkward happened that day. And it was the first night that, that I'd taken off from ever training uh, in one of the uh, the black belt, brown belt classes. Uh, generally speaking, Shihan Boots uh, doesn't show up for that black belt, brown belt class. Uh, but that night from 7 p.m., um, I was uh, getting drunk with my friend. Uh, the phone rang and it's like, uh, it's Shihan Boots. Uh, why are you not in class? And I was like, oh, shit. Um... Uh, also, I, uh, I, uh, and I really had no excuse and he could hear that I was a little bit drunk, but he let me get away with it. But just that, you know, that one day when you thought, I'm just going to take one day off, you know, and it's just like right there is when he cracked down on it. It was perfect. I was actually brilliant, man. Anyway, sometime after that, I got the opportunity to train with a guy uh, who, uh, at the dojo who's worked at night. So he was able to come in and work out with me in the morning. And those days would be really fun. Uh, I would send him a, ahead of time on like five minutes ahead of time when we ran the park, for example. So I'd have to try and catch up with him and it made me push harder and it made me really test myself a lot it was really good to have someone to train with for a while there um we always did the push-ups and other stuff like in the sandbag there uh, during this time i realized that winter had come and it was starting to get really cold and it was starting to get closer to the time when i was going to japan so the reality of going to Japan was starting to dawn on me and things started catching up. I never once thought that I did not want to go. I was always looking forward to going. My heart and mind had already left the day I got the letter from Sosai. It was just a question of time when I could leave and my leaving time was coming real soon. This is uh, the first chapter that we have now completed. Uh, I hope you enjoy what you listen to and that you will be coming back. There are a total of 23 chapters in the book. Uh, thank you very much for watching and we'll be back again sometime soon.